Um, Mike, thank you so much for having me here today. It's always fun to come back to St. Bonaventure. My first probably 10 years out, I came back every year and spoke to the HEOP students. I myself was part of the HEOP program. Um, and then there, a little time lapsed and it's always nice to be back. So I'm, I'm 20 years out, which seems really crazy to say it happens in the blink of an eye. Um, so today we're gonna talk about uh, leadership and when Mike and I talked about what this topic might look like, we discussed the idea of an inside job. So leadership being this process that we go through in our life that really evolves from the gut and grows inside of us over a period of time. And when you're in programs in college and you're learning and you're involved in formal education, you get all the skills and, and talents and training and things that, that you need to learn in order to perform your career. And great schools like St. Bonaventure also give you an opportunity to grow as a human being. You're exposed to things like service work and um, internship opportunities and um, you have to have hours. I know in the journalism program you have to have 400 hours of experience in order to graduate. So there's all these opportunities to engage and grow as a human being. But one of the things that I found in my path over the last 20 years is that nobody taught me how to evolve as a human being in a way that affected my leadership. Nobody taught me that. And there's actually models out there for us. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. But I'm gonna share with you a little bit about my personal journey and how I got to where I'm at. Um, and my story is an interesting one. So I came to St. Bonaventure right out of high school. Um, I probably shouldn't have been here, I mean, if, if we're being realistic. I had experienced a lot of issues in my life prior to that, and it's not something I've talked about openly. So there's a lot of people here today in the room that I've worked with at different times, that I've um, taken classes from, uh, and even some students that I've conversed with at one point or another. Um, and you may not know this part of me, but it's an important part of the story so that you can see my trajectory from where I began to where I am today. And as you think about your own personal leadership and that idea of an inside job um, and how it will affect your ability to succeed in life, how it will affect your ability to get that job that you wanna get, to succeed on the job, to move forward in your career, to have a stable and happy home life, to develop relationships with people that are meaningful and useful and help you evolve as a person and, and personally and professionally. And so my story started really on shaky ground. Um, when I was young, I experienced severe violence. Uh, went through some levels of abuse that no human being should really go through. And I didn't even know that was abnormal. To me, that was just life. This is what we experience. Um, we were poor. My family fell far below the poverty line. I never knew we were poor. I didn't know that. I mean, I just thought, like, so we got our clothes at Salvation Army. It, it didn't mean anything to me. My dad, we were a family of five. My dad made about $15,000 a year most of my life. He drove 400 miles a day as a, a courier for a medical company. Um, so he worked hard. But we had challenges and issues, things relating to, to addiction, relating to uh, mental illness and other factors that came into play. And so for me, by the time I was in middle school, I was classified at risk. I was put in a category that said, uh, this person is at risk for life failure in some form or another. Um, and when they classified me at, at, as at risk, they began to offer me programs and people and resources and ways to try to persevere through that. But usually at a young age, when you're exposed to this kind of, these kinds of issues, um, the last thing you wanna do is talk about them. So I didn't, I didn't. Um, and I went through some severe issues as a young person growing up. My senior year of high school, my guidance counselor, whose name is Betty Pappas, and if anyone's from the Olean district, you may know who Betty is, um, Betty, called down to the, the class that I was in and it came over the loudspeaker and she said, have Pam say report to my office. So I'm thinking, what, did I, what am I getting caught doing? Because I was always doing something bad. Um, and I figured I was busted and I was gonna go through some kind of like reprimand or whatever it was. So I walked down to Betty Pappas's office and uh, she told me to sit down, so I sat down, pretty compliant when it came to authority. 
And um, she said, Pam, I've been looking through your files. I've been watching you, I've been paying attention. And I've noticed some things. And I wanna to talk to you about it and I wanna to talk to you about your future. At this point, I had zero plans, none. I mean, there was no thought about the future. My life was about how do I get through today and make it to tomorrow? That's really all I ever thought about. Um, and how do I get away from the violence that I'm experiencing on, on a regular basis? And so I sat down in the chair across from Betty, she's behind her desk, and she says to me, I went through your files. I have your files from kindergarten all the way to senior year. And she said, you have amazing potential. Did you know that? And I'm thinking, what the hell is she talking about? Amazing potential, I don't even know what this means. And she said, you know, you used to be top of your class. You got moved ahead a year in math at some point. What happened? And I was like, I mean, I don't know. I'm just looking at her like I'm not saying anything right now because I have no idea what's coming. I have not had productive conversations like this in my life. I don't know what this woman's about to say to me. And she said, there's this program that exists that you qualify for. It's for low-income families. It's for people who have had challenges in their life that hindered their academic progress. And I would like you to apply for this program. It would allow you to go to college. But there's a catch. You have to leave like a week after graduation and go through this intensive preparation program. And what do you think? Are you willing? And I'm thinking, I, I'm willing. I have no idea what I'm going to do with myself the day after graduation. There is no plan. So if this means that I can leave my house and I can go somewhere and I'm going to be safe and no one can harm me, that sounds like a good plan. I'll do that. So I was excited about the idea of escape really more than anything. Um, at this time in my life, I'm not a healthy person. I'm raging, I'm angry, I'm escaping, I'm trying to get away from things. Um, there's been at least two occasions where the level of violence in my home escalated to the point of someone trying to kill me. I had no idea what was happening. So this idea of coming to this magical place called St. Bonaventure was pretty cool. I'm excited about it. So she has me fill out the application. She says, take this home, fill it out, send it, bring it back to me in my office. I'll send it in for you, and then we'll see what happens. So she sends the application in, and Bonas accepted me as a student. And I remember the day that I was sitting in my living room and the mailman came and put the mail in the box and th there was this envelope and it was a brown envelope. I don't know if it was part of the branding or what, the brown and white, um, but there was this brown envelope and I'm like, oh my gosh, and my heart started to race. Because now I had a plan and I was kind of excited about the plan. I had no idea what it meant, but I was excited about the plan. So uh, I opened the envelope and it said, you've been ex accepted into the HEOP program at St. Bonaventure, and this is the date you start. And it scared me, if I'm being totally honest with you. Because I think when we experience struggle in our lives, two things happen. We not only fear failure, but we also fear success. And I had a serious fear of success because I thought that you would notice that I'm a phony. So there was some fear there. And I spent the week between the day I graduated and the day I came to St. Bonaventure getting high every single day. That's all I did. I don't even know where I slept. I remember I slept on a park bench one night. That's about it. And so for me, coming here on this campus that first day, it was like an awakening. It was like I was walking outside of myself and suddenly I'm in this world that I don't know, but it seems like it's full of possibility. That was so exciting. And I didn't know where everybody else was coming from. But what I found here was I found people from all kinds of walks of life, all different circumstances, all different lenses and viewpoints who had been through different things in their lives. They had their own challenges, whether they were severe as mine or not. We all had challenges and issues that we were facing. I'll tell you that most of the kids that I was really good friends with growing up became the statistic. So when I say to you I shouldn't be standing here today, I mean it. I have friends who died of overdoses. I have a lot of friends who killed themselves. 
a lot. Suicide was a very real thing in my friend group. I had a lot of friends that ended up in jail and in mental institutions. This was a normal way of living for us. And so for me, coming here, having this opportunity defied the statistic, but it took more than that. I can tell you that when I came into this school and started to learn, there was a whole period of time where I was fighting myself. My tendencies, my habits, my behaviors, my thought processes. Later in life, I was diagnosed with complex PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder derived from childhood violence. And I realized that part of my experience all throughout my time at St. Bonaventure and early into my career was marked with these physical reactions that I had absolutely no control over whatsoever. So there was times I skipped class. There was times that uh, I didn't leave my room. And I came across as a pretty put together person most of the time. But I struggled through it. It was hard. So how did I go from that kid in eighth grade, being classified at risk, having all these issues and challenges, to a vice president of a college, <coughs> running an entire department full of multiple different teams that are actually doing amazing, innovative things, and they look to me for support and guidance in how to do that. It just seems wild to me to even talk about it now. But there was a process that I went through from A to Z that helped me develop as a human being and grow my leadership in a way that was not only transformational for my life, but it was transformational for every human being that I came in contact with on my teams. And it's been an amazing process. And I think it's really launched itself just recently. So uh, you see the little guy here in his Superman cape. I love this picture because my brother had a Superman cape that looked similar to this when he was a kid, and he wore it everywhere. I mean, he'd be like riding down the street in his underwear on his bike with nothing but that cape on. So it like brings back some funny memories. Um, <clears throat> so there was this article in Forbes magazine that was penned by this gentleman named uh, Kevin Cruz. And he wanted to understand this concept of leadership. And so he decided that he would go and interview the greatest leaders in the world. And he would ask them, what is leadership? And he talked to people like Bill Gates and some of the, the biggest, most successful leaders in our country and in our world. And he asked them, what, how do you define leadership? And they said things like, uh, a leader is somebody who has followers. What do you think about that? Is that how you define great leadership? I mean, Hitler had followers for Pete's sake. I wouldn't define him as a great leader. Uh, another person said, a leader is someone that can translate vision into reality. Well, I don't know if that's leadership. I mean, if you're an artist, you have a vision in your mind and you can create something real out of it, but that doesn't necessarily equate to great leadership. So these things were said, there were several of them, and all of them fell short, which was really interesting to me coming from some of the best leaders in the world who couldn't even really articulate what leadership was. This is a, a, a vast area of our personal development that we have neglected. So I set about to really study and learn what leadership was. Um, I had an opportunity when I worked at Houghton College to go through a leadership development program that we then used to create a community-based leadership program that trained adults on how to be leaders. And um, in the four years that I ran the program, we graduated, I think, 60 people. And every single person in that group took a promotion or joined a board of directors or completely changed their <coughs> career and their life because they found their passion. Every single person in the group. So we're on to something. There's this way to develop our leadership. Um, so the guy who wrote this article, after um, he talked to these leaders and got these definitions of leadership that really fell short, came up with his own definition of leadership, and I love it. I think it's a phenomenal definition. So what is leadership? He said that leadership is a process. So leadership doesn't occur. You're not born with it. You aren't suddenly um, innately 
gifted with the ability to lead just because someone gave you a title and a salary. It's a process of development that lives inside of us. And it's a process that we can pass on to others when we've integrated it into our own personality. So leadership is a process, and it's a process of social influence. The purpose of leadership is not just to achieve a goal, but it's to influence a society or a group of individuals to achieve that goal together. Because through multiple perspectives and the integration of a variety of lenses and skills and abilities, we can create innovative solutions, right? And so leadership is a process of social influence. It maximizes the efforts of others. So if Pam sat down in a room and decided to solve problem X, and I wrote that problem on a piece of paper, and then I wrote my solution to it, that solution is coming from one mind, one skill set, and one window of lens of life. I have a limited life experience, don't we all? So in order to create innovative solutions, in order to solve problems holistically in a way that positively impacts everyone and is best for society, we have to incorporate the efforts of others. So my solution to problem X would be different if you and you and you and you all came together in a room and we all contributed to that process. Leadership knows how to do that. And it's toward the achievement of a goal. So as a leader, we begin to understand that it is our job to define the process of how we're going to get from A to B. And B better be something exciting and visionary and challenging and positive, something that impacts the institution, the organization, the business, the nonprofit, or the world or the community in some really positive, exciting way. And so a leader engages in this process of social influence. They bring people around a vision and an idea to build a strategy that will help them achieve a goal. That's leadership. Really great leaders are magnetic leaders. So what is a magnet? A magnet is an actual object that has this invisible field that lives around it that you cannot see. And it's an energy field. And when you put something near the magnet that is naturally attracted to it, the energy field draws it in to the magnet. Really good leaders do that. They do it every day. There are okay leaders out there. And they can accomplish a lot. You know, They can achieve goals. But have you ever worked with a magnetic leader? Or have you ever seen a magnetic leader on TV or in the news? Or have you ever been exposed to a family member that you would consider a magnetic leader, that kind of person that just has the right energy and enthusiasm and respects you and your viewpoint and your perspective, but also holds people accountable? And through that process, that leader draws other human beings into their natural force field. There are some amazing leaders in the world that have done this, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them. So I often think about who people were when they were kids. I think about this a lot because of who I was when I was a kid. And I think about how I became who I am today and how that part of me that was young and innocent and had some naturally endowed gifts that were in me. Maybe if you're a person of faith, gifts from God. Um, if you're not a person of faith, that's fine. Just some natural chemical things in your body that make you you and you're different than everybody else. And I often think about these leaders and who they were. So you, you know who they are. This is Martin Luther King Jr. This is Gandhi in the middle. And this is Mother Teresa at the end. So do you think this little guy in a really cute dapper suit ever thought in a million years that he would do what he did? Do you think he ever thought he would accomplish what he accomplished in this country? And I certainly don't think he ever thought he would get shot for it. 
It was dangerous. And it was scary. But he stepped up to that challenge because he had a vision. When you think about that definition of leadership, this is a magnetic person. What he did for this country led to someone burning his house down, threatening his family's life. Now, I walk into my office every day, and there are challenges, and there are issues that I have to address. But I don't ever face the kind of challenges that he faced. So am I brave enough, am I strong enough, am I capable enough to take those challenges and face them in a way that's both, I would say, altruistic, but also aggressive enough to get us where we need to go? Great leaders do that. There's a great story about Gandhi that I love to share. Uh, this is him when he was a kid. He was so cute. I highly doubt he ever thought that he would be traveling through a foreign country, riding on a train. This is an a educated man who has gone to college. He is considered a scholar. He has achieved amazing things in his life. He's no schmuck, for lack of a better word. And he was riding on this train, and it was far away from home. And he was sitting in first class, because he had bought a first class ticket. And this white woman got on the train, and she didn't have a first class ticket, but felt that she was entitled to it. And so she just caused this big ruckus, and started complaining and screaming, and demanded that he give up his seat. And he said no. I bought my ticket. I'm sitting in my seat. I'm sure he didn't say it like that. That's Pam's interpretation of how he might have said it. Um, and a group of men proceeded to drag him out of the seat and throw him off a moving train. That was their response to him. Now his response is what gives me goosebumps. He decided that it would be his life's mission to take that experience and create change in the world. And his goal was to be in, in this country and show people that his people were smart and capable and equal. And so he rallied a group of individuals. It was wartime, there was, there was a, a battle going on, there were soldiers dying, and he brought a whole group of men from his home country together to actually transport the sick and wounded and dead from the battlefield back to the hospitals. And he did it for the purpose of showing everybody that here we are, we are partners, we are capable. He was trying to demystify these biases. And I highly doubt that that kid had the skills and abilities to achieve that. But somewhere through the course of his life, he developed the ability to communicate, to inspire passion, to rally people around an idea, to move them to action for a cause. And that was his leadership. And I, I don't think that Mother Teresa, when she was a little girl, ever thought in a million years that she would travel to a foreign country that was really in third world poverty and motivate groups of individuals to set up programs that today we would consider grassroots human services efforts by herself, vulnerable and not safe. I don't think the little girl said, that's what I want to do when I grow up. But she was moved by something, and she had the ability to do an inner work, I like to call it, the inside job. And she did that inside job on herself until she was brave enough, confident enough, and capable enough to accomplish an astounding feat in leadership. So these are great examples. Leadership is a process, and I talked a little bit about that. If you, if, I know this is being recorded, so you can probably get the recording, but if, if you write anything down today, I think something you should write down is social change model for leadership development. It's a tool that you can use after today to study and research how to develop yourself as a leader. But the social change model for leadership development 
Um, it was created by a think tank at UCLA in the 1990s, and they said there's got to be a process we can engage in to grow people to become their ultimate best leader individually. And they defined it and studied it and researched it enough that they came up with the seven C's, and each of the seven C's walks you through a process. The first C, to me, is the absolutely most important one. In the social change model, they call it consciousness of self. That the first step that you have to take toward achieving your best leadership is consciousness of self. We don't necessarily teach that. So how do you do it? Bill George is the author of a book called True North, and if you've not read it, it is a phenomenal, awesome book. It was required reading during my MBA program. And Bill was the CEO of a big national company, and he um, had sustained leadership over decades with this company, and everybody loved him. He was one of those leaders that just resonated with people. When he retired from the company, he decided to teach, and he became a business professor at Harvard. And he took a sabbatical, um, to do some research and he decided he wanted to find out what is it? What is it that makes great leaders? Like why was I a great leader? He didn't even know and obviously most leaders don't know what makes them great leaders and so he set out on a journey to discover that thread. He interviewed every leader he could find all over the country, leaders of great big companies and not the rise and fall leaders. So not a leader that came in, did some cool stuff, but ultimately failed and left. Or just jumps from opportunity to opportunity and always looks successful but never really achieves anything. He interviewed the leaders that were with their organizations for a long period of time through a change management process and were successful at rallying people around it. And after all these hundreds of interviews, he discovered something. There was a theme. There was a thread that weaved throughout this whole entire process. And the theme was this. All great leaders faced intense crucibles in their lives. He calls them crucibles. I mean, I think of a crucible and I think of like Jesus dragging that cross down the dirt road. You know what I mean? These are intense challenges that we face. It doesn't have to be the kind of intense challenge I face. I have a 16-year-old with the most severe form of ADHD you can ever imagine to the point where it's a learning disability. That's a crucible. If your parents got divorced when you were 14 years old, that's a crucible. You know, if you got bullied when you were in school, that's a crucible. If you had loved ones and adults in your life that didn't give you enough attention, that's a crucible. We all have them. No one in this planet is exempt from crucibles. And if you didn't experience your own crucibles, then you were exposed to some, right? Just living on this planet with flawed human beings, you will be exposed to crucibles. So we all battle with it, we all face it. So these leaders faced intense crucibles in their lives. But then they did something different than everybody else. What they did was they dug in. They picked it apart. They figured out who am I and what makes me tick and why am I the way I am. And they relied on, they didn't do it in isolation, they relied on other human beings to help them through the process. And by talking to other human beings, they grew and evolved, they began to understand themselves better. And as they put their life story into context, something happened. What happened was, they became the most authentic, truest version of themselves. We call it congruence. When you live life in alignment with your story and your values, and you're the same person, whether you're in front of your mom, your kid, your boss, you know, you're at church, you're hanging out with your buddies on a Friday night, you know who I am, you're always gonna get the same thing. Congruence leads to trust, trust leads to great leadership. It's a process. And how many people think that in order to be the best leader that you can possibly be, that you have to go to counseling? I mean, we don't talk about that, right? Or if not counseling, that you have to find a mentor or a coach or someone that you can talk to and be vulnerable with. 
that that may be the very thing that either launches you into your best leadership or unhinges it completely. It's not what we think about when we think about leadership development, but it's an important part. I wanted to give you a chance to hear it from Bill himself because he talks about it so beautifully. I have no idea if the sound will work in here. I can try it. If it doesn't work, we'll just skip past it. Nope. Do you think there's a way? Maybe there? I can try it. I have no idea. That's okay. You know what? Let's just skip it. Not a big deal. Um, what Bill talks about in this video is the idea of doing an inner work. Um, and I think one of the most important parts about an inner work is this idea that we connect with somebody. So he says that leaders who have developed long, sustained, fruitful, successful leadership and a great followership connect with another human being on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So for me, when I started going through this process, I developed what I called seed planters. And later, when I published my first book, I named my company Seed Planners. And I'll tell you the story behind that in a second. Um, but these were people I was connecting with on a regular basis. Just to say, like, what's going on with me, what my challenges are, how it's going, ask questions. This was really important for me in the early years of my profession. But eventually, that wasn't enough. Um, I would say about three years ago, I hit a low that I had never experienced in my life. When you grow up with severe dysfunction and you begin to have success, you can fall under the illusion that you somehow arrived and that the past doesn't matter anymore because I made it. I'm successful. You know, someone else in my family is a drug addict and someone else in my family is severely mentally ill, but I'm not, you know, I'm doing good things. I got a promotion this year, so everything's cool. I'm good. I don't need to worry about that stuff anymore. Well, it never goes away. It really never goes away. It never goes away. It's there, and it'll play out in interesting ways in your life that you don't even notice sometimes, you know, how, how a certain personality type affects you. I mean, and that's the root of implicit bias. So if you want to create a changed world where we care for one another and we're inclusive, you have to start here. You know, some of my own implicit biases were rooted in the trauma that I experienced and the kind of people that traumatized me. Now I just hired somebody and that person looks like the person who traumatized me. How do you think that made me feel? That's an implicit bias. And I cannot harm this person's life and career because I have issues. I can't do that. It's not right. It's not ethical. So I have to figure that out. These are deep life challenges that if we're going to succeed together, we have to face. So having seed planters was amazing, but it wasn't enough. And there came a time when I had to move beyond that. So I actually started trauma therapy a few years ago. Now I'm a vice president, I'm serving on an executive team, you know, I'm sitting around the board table, I'm presenting my case for support for projects to the board of trustees, I'm sitting down with donors who have the capability of giving, you know, a million dollars to the institution, and I have these unresolved issues. And I'll tell you how it played out, because I just love putting it all out on the table. I'll tell you how it played out. There came a time in the executive team where we started to have to make some really tough decisions. And it was a matter of resources and who would get resources, which department had priorities. Um, and some people thought my department wasn't a priority and they had every right to think that. But instead of me making my case and then allowing a group to make a decision, whatever it might be, I got defensive and angry and confrontational. And if someone got aggressive with me, like my reaction to aggression is bring it. Like I will bring it right back to you. So I started to get aggressive with my colleagues. 
I hadn't done that up to this point. But all that stuff was coming out of me. And I realized, like, these are triggers, these are issues. If I don't resolve these issues in my life, I am going down. I'm going to be one of those rise and fall leaders that never makes it any further than I have right now. So I started trauma therapy. I joined a group called ACA, which is Adult Children of Alcoholics and Family Dysfunction. I got my two-year coin on October 7th. I'm really proud of myself. I've passed some of that trauma on to my daughter, unknowingly, trying to be the best parent I can be, take her everywhere, invest in everything she wants to do. You know, she loves cosplay. I don't know if anybody in here likes that, but she's really into it. So we go to conventions all over the country and she dresses in these costumes. I'll take you anywhere you want. You know, I'm ready, let's do this. I'm gonna be different. And yet I still unknowingly pass trauma on to her just because of my personality issues. So. Next month in November, she has six months in ACA. She came into the program as a teenager, and it's having a, an unbelievable effect on her life. Unbelievable effect. And honestly, what got me thinking about doing this was the fact that I couldn't get along with people at work. It was about my leadership. It was about becoming a better professional, but as a result, it affected my whole entire life. So I shared with my leadership team that I was doing this. I just wanted them to know, I have this set of issues. We did a 360 degree evaluation process and they were like, Pam's too aggressive. I don't want my colleagues, I, I'm gonna be aggressive. There's gonna be a time and a place for that. But how do I do it in a way that's appropriate and doesn't create enemies? That's the challenge, right? So um, I let my colleagues know I was doing this and the most recent, we had to do a two-year recap of the 360-degree evaluation, and the other people on the executive team with me reported uh, unanimously that they see great changes in me. I'm really proud of that. You know, so part of leadership is about allowing yourself to be a human being, first and foremost, who is fallible, who has gifts and abilities, <coughs> but who also makes mistakes and can be honest about it and grow from it. So when I think about seed planters, I put a couple pictures up here, and actually a few of my seed planters are in the room today. I don't want to embarrass them, um, but Doug was one of my professors. Dr. Gann, who left, was also one of my professors when I was here. They could probably tell you some stories. I don't know. I remember them. You might not. Um, two of my former bosses are here today. So Kelly and Bob um, both supervised me at different times on the job. And I learned so much from them. You have no idea. I think about them all the time and the influence that they had on my life. Those are seed planters. So a seed planter is a person who says or does something to show others that they have value, who invests in their own growth and the growth of those around them. And a really good seed planter this is the kind of person you want to look for in your life as you're developing your own leadership abilities. A really good seed planner knows what their own gifts are. And they use those strengths to add something positive to the world. Betty Pappas, the guidance counselor that I had, she was a seed planner. She tossed the seed out onto the ground never knowing if it was going to bloom or not. But she did it every day with all kinds of kids, not just me, because that's who she was. I had a chance to touch base with her about 10 years after I graduated and I was starting to see some real success in my life. And I went to a big luncheon and I was speaking or something and she had heard about it and she showed up. And I just remember looking across the room and seeing her face and thinking, you have no idea what you did for my life. No idea. I would not be here today. I'm sure of that. And I looked across the room and I saw her and I started to bawl and she started to sob and we ran across the room, we gave each other a big hug. It was like a scene out of a movie, it was amazing. Okay, these are seed planters. So I want you to take some time to think about who your seed planter might be. And don't risk this common behavior that happens all the time that says, you know what, this is too hard um, and, and I don't know anybody and this is uncomfortable and I'm, I have no one. I mean, we do this thing all the time where we're like, I'm so alone. You know, I just feel so alone. I don't have anybody to help me. Bullshit. 
all right? Excuse my language. It's bullshit. There are so many people here that will help you. And it doesn't matter what it is. You find somebody that you can talk to on a regular basis that can help guide you down this path. And it doesn't have to be, you know, if, if you can't find an individual or you aren't brave enough to do it, go to the counseling center where it is their job. There's no shame in that. To sit down with another human being on a regular basis, look across the table, and talk about what it is that's going on inside of you. I promise you that the money and the time that you're investing into your education is equal to the time you invest into yourself. And if you don't do this piece, this piece will not provide you with the full value that it can provide you. But if you do this piece, and you connect with somebody, and you talk, and you work through things, and you figure out who you are, and you live that life consistently on a regular basis, the investment that you're making here now in your education and your future will be tenfold. I remember one time someone said to me, uh, what's your leadership development plan? And I, I had been through this program, and I had a plan I had written out. I would not say that out loud if someone was threatening my life because I felt like it was crazy. Like, I had said in that plan, this was years ago, I had said in that plan, um, I want to be a public speaker because if I got in front of a crowd, I would, like, pee my pants. Seriously, I'm not even kidding. It was that bad. I said, I want to learn how to do that. Um, I'd really like to get my master's someday and maybe my doctorate eventually. I'd like to write a book and get it published. You know, and someday I want to like travel all over the world and speak. And I have done all of that. But when I wrote it, it was like, I'm going to write this on a piece of paper and it's never going to happen. This, like someone told me, go big, like just say the craziest thing. I never would have said that out loud. My education, my experience, the people I was exposed to got me to a certain place. This launched it into the stratosphere. I believe that. So don't forget to do the part that's called an inner work. And as you do that part, there's something really important that you have to focus on. And that is, who are you as a human being? So when we talk about an inner work, I'm getting towards the end of my time here. When we talk about an inner work, we talk about figuring out who you are, digging it out, you know, digging in and, and figuring out what makes you tick. Part of that process is also, has to be a balance, right? It can't just be what's happened to me, what's wrong, what are my deficiencies, where do I need to grow? It also has to be what am I phenomenal at? And own it, right? I know what I'm great at, and I feel really good about it. I feel awesome about it. And I'm going to live out of those strengths on a daily basis. There's a great book called Strength-Based Leadership, 12 bucks on Amazon. Back of the book, you get a code. Code allows you to take a, a test. It's called the Strength Finder. It'll tell you what your top five strengths are. I've given it to hundreds of people. It is so accurate, I can't even tell you. There's 34 strengths that you can get, and it gives you your top five. It doesn't give you your bottom five. And I talked about this in a class earlier today. Why would you want to, if you're right-handed, why would you want to spend the rest of your life writing with your left hand? Why would you do that? It's pointless. You might want to try to grow that part a little bit because you, you need your left hand. But you're going to write with your right hand because it's faster, it's easier, you're better at it, it looks better, the outcome is really, really good. So that's the idea of strength-based leadership is that when you understand who you are and what you're great at, you can begin to hone that and live out of those strengths every day of your life. And as a result, you move from normal to great. Okay? It's also impactful on teams, but we can talk about that another time. Um, I do this with my team all the time, and we take all the strengths of the entire team, we compile them into a chart, and we look at what is the, the cumulative strength of our entire team. So I have a team with a lot of empathy and learning. What do you think that looks like in a team meeting? Everybody's very kind to each other, and we just want to talk about all these ideas all the time, but we may never get anything done. 
right? Because there's nobody on our team that has activator as a strength. I mean, that's kind of an issue. So it's important for hiring, but more importantly, it's just a, an awareness thing. So if I know this is the makeup of my team, I know where we're deficient, I know what we're awesome at, I can kind of hone those skills and abilities so that we can perform at our best, and I can put structures in place to address the deficiencies. So understanding your strengths and knowing how they work is a really important part of this process. I mentioned earlier the social change model to you for leadership development. I really hope you take this and take a look at it. Um, there are the seven C's of the social change model and you can literally just Google these and go through them one by one in your life. So in addition to doing the inner work, which I think is more important than anything, if you do anything after you leave here today in order to develop your own personal leadership, I would suggest that you just once a month look one of these up, read about it, and try to understand what it means. And then later you begin to practice those skills and abilities. So these are some questions for you, and I'd like you to take them with you. If you want to take a photo of it, you can. Um, I can certainly uh, email it to Mike. Um, I can also throw it up on my LinkedIn page if you want to um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and I'll put the questions on there so that you can just hop on and download them. Um, I'll just put it right on my page. So who are your seed planners? Do you have any? This is something for you to think about. What characteristics do they display? And how can you find one if you don't have one? It's really important to do that. Look at the seven C's of the social change model and ask yourself, what is my current approach to this and how can I improve it? <coughs> do the inner work. What have your greatest challenges in life been? Define them, write them down. Talk about that with somebody. And how have you overcome it? And if you haven't fully overcome it yet, how might you? These are questions I ask myself on a daily basis. What strengths do you gain from those challenges? So when I think about my life growing up and the kid that I was, um, when someone had their hands wrapped around my neck, can I take anything positive out of that? Well, hell yeah, I can. I am a really strong person. I'm really not scared of much of anything. And I take that bravery and that courage into my leadership and my work every single day of my life. There's a fearlessness that comes out of that challenge, so I thank God for that challenge. I've put it into context. What are some of your greatest strengths and how are they different from the strengths of those around you? And how might joining that diversity of strength and perspective together Strengthen the outcome for what it is that you're working on. I think when you start to figure out the answers to these questions, you're going to feel a whole lot like this guy. Because I do every single day. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike for the code, and we'll take some questions. Okay, yeah. all right, he'll get the code going. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Go ahead. So what made you want to pursue writing? Writing? So her question was what made you want to pursue writing? Um, and I have a great story about that. I'll make it really brief. Um, when I was a kid growing up, and, and I was going through all that stuff. I remember this moment when I was like eight years old. And I don't know if it was just the stress and anxiety of my life at that point, but um, I, my fingers started to tingle, like my fingertips. And it was almost like, I, I equate it to like addiction, but it was like I just had this compulsion to put a pen in my hand. And sometimes I think it, it was a gift from God, I really believe that. Um, but I used to barricade myself way in the back of the closet and I would just write. I'd write letters, I'd write memoirs, I'd write like funny stories. Sometimes I'd just write like what was around me. Um, so I've always loved writing. And then slowly over time I got good feedback on it. You know, it would make people laugh. It would, um, 
I'd get an A on an English assignment, you know what I mean? And I thought, this is, I just noticed it was something that, that I was good at. And so, I don't know, I mean, I was taking anything good I could hang on to at that point in my life. And so that to me was like a shining star of something that felt good. Um, and I still love it. So, thanks for the question. Anything else? Other questions? Yeah. How have you uh, handled like being another person? Being what? Like being another person's planet. Yeah, I love that. That's the coolest part to me. So, I mean, in my program of recovery, we always talk about giving back as like the ultimate goal of service being the ultimate goal of your recovery. And um, I love that part. So I connect all the time with people. I mean, it's a pretty regular thing. I consider this giving back, you know, and being a seed planner in a different way. But the one-on-one -on -one is important. I think for me, there was a period of time where I struggled with boundaries. So um, I had like a lot of young women that would come to me and, and want to talk. And sometimes I would like cross lines, you know, because I wanted to help so bad. But I learned about that and um, eventually like kind of figured out how to navigate <coughs> that stuff. Um, but I would say the seed planning, it, you know, when you get to this place in your life, um, I find that every single day at work, the, the people who work for me, um, if they're willing to grow and evolve and, and achieve together, um, I'll coach them up or out. I mean, if they're not willing, we'll, we'll coach you right out. Um, but if they are willing, then I'll work with them every day. I don't, you know, I have a, an employee that comes to me on a regular basis and we talk about challenges. You know, I think that's part of what we do. We give back, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, do you believe that leadership is a sustained quality? Like, um, a lot of internships are asking me, do they have time you've shown leadership? It's not like a specific one time thing. It's kind of like a thing you do over a course of a period. Yeah. Over a course of, like, a semester. Do you agree with that philosophy? I do. I think leadership is becomes a, a part of your personality. It sort of becomes innate to who you are as a human being. I think the question that they're asking is trying to find evidence to the fact that you can motivate people. You know what I mean? So I would, I would almost look at that question in that way. Um, if someone asked me, can you give me an example of a time you showed leadership? I'd share about successes that I had with a team. You know what I mean? I think that's kind of what they're getting at. But I agree with you. I think leadership isn't an event. It's a, a lifelong journey. Any other questions? Okay. All right, well, thank you so much for being here today. Have a great night. Before you leave, we have uh, uh, Adriana. Uh, we also thanks. just wanted to give something to Pam for taking the time out of her week to speak with us and show our appreciation on behalf of the Foster Center and thank Professor Gallagher for setting this up. Pam for being here today, and thanks everyone who joined us. Thanks.